Now that we know the names of all the components of the muscle fiber, it's time to talk about how they work together to cause muscle contraction to occur. This is known as the sliding filament model of muscle contraction. This is a series of electrochemical events that allow myosin to form cross bridges with actin and then drag the actin over the myosin. So the actin slides over the myosin. This will make the entire sarcomere shorten. And this event will happen in each sarcomere of the muscle fiber all at the same time. Nerves have to stimulate the muscles to contract. The skeletal muscle is stimulated by a somatic motor neuron. The axons of these motor neurons travel in a single nerve from the central nervous system to the skeletal muscle. As the nerve enters the muscle, the various neurons, and at this point it's the axons of the neurons that are involved, branch to go to individual muscle cells. They're going to form what's called a neuromuscular junction. This is where the axon end will communicate with a muscle fiber. The neuromuscular junction is the location where the axon and the muscle interact. The axon terminal is the very end of the nerve cell, the end of the axon. It does not directly touch the muscle cell. There is a small gap between the axon and the muscle cell. This is called the synaptic cleft. In the axon terminals, there are vesicles that store the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. The motor end plate is that part of the sarcolemma that's immediately opposite the axon terminal. This part of the muscle fiber will contain acetylcholine receptors. The action potential on the axon, and we'll talk about what an action potential is when we talk about the nervous system, is going to cause the release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. So we have an action potential on the axon, the nerve, and here is where the axon branches to the axon terminals, and this is the communication point with the muscle cell. So this is a neuromuscular junction. Here we see these vesicles that contain acetylcholine, and the action potential coming down will cause the acetylcholine to be released into this synaptic cleft, the gap between the neuron and the muscle cell. And there will be receptors on the motor end plate, that part of the muscle cell membrane that's immediately opposite the axon terminals. And when the acetylcholine attaches to its receptor, it's going to cause a change in the muscle cell. The muscle will be signaled to contract when the acetylcholine binds to its receptor. This is going to cause an action potential to start on the muscle fiber. We say that the muscle fiber depolarizes. There is a change in the electrical charge on the sarcolemma. The muscle will immediately repolarize, that is, it will go back to what it was before, so this is a very quick, instantaneous kind of change in the sarcolemma. There is something called a refractory period. There's a little bit of time between the depolarization and the repolarization. In that time period, the muscle cannot respond to another stimulus. Repolarization has to occur before another stimulus can be accepted. So looking again at the neuromuscular junction, the action potential on the neuron will cause the release of acetylcholine. Acetylcholine will diffuse across the synapse and attach to the receptors on the motor end plate. And this is going to cause this wave of depolarization, an action potential to spread all along the sarcolemma. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease where those acetylcholine receptors are damaged. This means that acetylcholine cannot cause a depolarization of the muscle cell, and we have faulty muscle contraction. This usually affects the neck and face muscles, so we see droopy upper eyelids and eventually difficulty with swallowing. Curare was harvested from plants by native Africans. Curare actually blocks acetylcholine receptors. If those receptors are blocked, then no contraction can occur and this causes paralysis. It was used by African hunters to paralyze animals so that they could get closer to them and actually kill them. During the Korean War, doctors started using curare during surgery to help keep muscles relaxed so that they could do better surgical procedures. Now that we have the action potential on the sarcolemma, we're ready to signal the sliding filaments. This is called the excitation-contraction coupling reaction. The action potential on the sarcolemma spreads down the T-tubules. You'll remember T-tubules are extensions of the sarcolemma that go deep into the muscle cell. This is going to trigger the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. Those T-tubules are very close to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, so the action potential on the sarcolemma triggers the sarcoplasmic reticulum. 
Calcium is necessary to initiate the sliding of the filaments. The myosin binding sites on actin, remember, are covered by tropomyosin. This means that the myosin and the actin cannot connect. Troponin is attached to the tropomyosin to control the tropomyosin. Calcium attaches to the troponin and that changes its shape. And when troponin's shape is changed, that's going to pull the tropomyosin away from the myosin binding sites. Now the energized myosin head can bind to those myosin binding sites on the actin. So here we see we've got the action potential on the sarcolemma. It's going to go down the T tubules. It's going to trigger the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium into the sarcoplasm. This is a closer view. So this is the sarcolemma. And here's the T tubule going down into the cell. And so as we have that action potential, it's going to travel down into the T tubules. And that's going to trigger the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. The calcium will bind to the troponin. The troponin is attached to the tropomyosin, and the tropomyosin is covering those myosin binding sites. When we change the shape of the troponin, we pull the tropomyosin away from the myosin binding sites, and now if we have an energized myosin head, it will attach to the actin at the myosin binding site. This is known as cross-bridge formation. So the cross-bridge formation, that energized myosin head attaching to the actin binding site, is the beginning of the sliding of the filaments. The myosin head will undergo something called a power stroke. The ATP that was attached to the myosin split earlier. This cocked the myosin head into its cocked position, its ready position. When it's in that position and it attaches to actin, it power strokes. It pulls the actin myofilament closer to the M line, closer to the center of the sarcomere. Then the cross bridge detachment occurs. We need ATP for this to occur. ATP has to attach to the myosin head, recocking it. So we recock the myosin head. The head is then able to attach to the next available binding site on actin and slide the filament again. This process will continue as long as calcium is present to take care of the troponin and keep those myosin binding sites open, and as long as there is adequate ATP to cause the cross bridge to break and the myosin heads to recock. So we start with cross bridge formation. The calcium moved the tropomyosin off of the myosin binding sites and that cocked head is ready to go. It attaches. It power strokes, pulling the actin toward the midline. And if ATP is present, it will attach the myosin head, causing the detachment and recocking of the myosin head. If there is another myosin binding site available, it will reattach, power stroke, if ATP is present, it will detach and recock. And this will continue as long as we have calcium available to keep the myosin binding sites open and ATP available to break the cross bridges and recock the myosin head. Here we see a relaxed muscle, and there it is contracted. You can see we've slid the actin molecules together, and we've lost some of that banding that we saw earlier. So relaxed, contracted. Rigor mortis is something that happens at death. It's a stiffening of the muscles that starts about three to four hours after death and peaks at about 12 hours. Then over the next 48 to 60 hours, it dissipates, it falls off. This occurs because calcium in the extracellular fluid can't be kept out of the cells. Once you die, there's no more pumps to help keep the membranes active, and so ions begin to move into the cell that normally don't come into the cell. So as calcium comes in, that's going to initiate cross bridge formation. After the ATP is all used up, and that will eventually happen, cross bridges can't detach. We can't detach and recock the myosin head. So the actin and the myosin stay linked, and that leads to that permanent contraction, that stiffness that is rigor mortis. The reason it eventually goes away is because all of these structures are protein in nature, and protein eventually degrades. So eventually the actin and myosin degrade to the point that they can't stay attached to each other. Muscle relaxation occurs because we stop getting a signal from the nervous system to contract. The acetylcholine that's put into the synapse degrades fairly quickly, and no more acetylcholine is released if there is no more nervous stimulation of the muscle. We don't have an action potential on the sarcolemma, 
The sarcolemma repolarizes completely, and when that happens, calcium is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcequestrin is a protein in the sarcoplasmic reticulum that binds the calcium and makes sure it stays in there. We've got a lot of phosphate in the sarcoplasm, and we need to get the calcium away from the phosphate. Calcium and phosphate will interact to make hydroxyapatite, and that's what makes bone hard, so we don't want that to happen in the muscle. Since there's no calcium attached to the troponin, the tropomyosin covers the actin binding sites back up and the myofilaments return to their resting length as a result of those elastic filaments that are in there. Each muscle, each skeletal muscle, is served by at least one motor nerve. That motor nerve contains axons of up to hundreds of different motor neurons. These axons all have branches to axon terminals, and these are what form the neuromuscular junctions with muscle fibers. A motor unit is the motor neuron, the one neuron, and all of the muscle cells it stimulates. So if we look at this particular nerve right here, this nerve only has two axons in it. One comes out and interacts with these three muscle fibers, so that is one motor unit, and the other one comes out and interacts with these two muscle fibers. That axon and those two muscle fibers are another motor unit. Here we actually see a photomicrograph of that. When a motor neuron fires, all of the fibers it controls will contract fully. It's the all or none principle. They either contract completely or they don't contract at all. The motor units in muscles usually contract asynchronously. That is, they don't all contract at the same time. This helps prevent muscle fatigue. The size of motor units will vary depending upon the muscle. Muscles that need precise control will have very small motor units, one neuron and two or three or four muscle cells. This we see in the larynx, the muscles of the fingers, the muscles that control the eye. Less precise movements, you'll have larger motor units. You may have one motor neuron and 50 or 60 muscle cells that it controls. The gastrocnemius, that big muscle in your calf, for example, does not have very precise movement. If we want to plot a muscle twitch, we can do a myogram. This is just a way to look at one stimulus, one action potential on a muscle cell. And a myogram is simply an instrument that records that muscular activity. So if we start with a stimulus, there will be a short period of time that the muscle does not respond at all. This is called the latent period. Then we will see the muscle fiber shorten. This will be the contraction period. And then, since there is not another stimulus, the muscle will relax. So this is the relaxation period. During the latent period, we are depolarizing the sarcolemma and getting calcium released in the sarcoplasm. That takes just a little bit of time. Once we have the calcium out there, then we can have the contraction occur. This is when the cross bridges can form because the calcium has opened up those myosin binding sites on the actin molecule. If there is not another stimulus, then the sarcolemma will repolarize, there will be no action potential, and so the calcium will be pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and those myosin binding sites will be recovered, and we can't make cross bridges. If we look at it in terms of time, this is in milliseconds, it happens very quickly, a very short latent period, the contraction period, and then notice the relaxation period takes a little longer. It takes a while to pump that calcium back in. If muscles only worked by muscle twitches, then all of our movements would be very jerky. But healthy muscles show nice, smooth contraction that vary in strength. We call these graded muscle responses. There are two ways that muscle responses can be graded. One is by changing the frequency of stimulation, and the other is to change the strength of the stimulation. Graded responses that involve changing the frequency involve wave or temporal summation. We increase contraction force by increasing the firing rate of the motor neurons. We have them fire more frequently. Rapid succession of a stimulus results in a second twitch that's a little stronger than the first twitch. We have some partial relaxation in between the stimuli. If we continue to increase the frequency until there is no relaxation, we have a nice, smooth muscle contraction. That is referred to as tetanus. Now, if a muscle is in tetanus for a long period of time, the muscle will fatigue. So here you see a basic muscle twitch. That's latent period contraction relaxation. And here is we're starting to increase the frequency. So it contracts, it relaxes a little bit. The next time it contracts, a higher higher, higher, 
and here we have the stimuli coming so quickly that it never relaxes. So we just stay in contraction until we stop the stimulus and then we allow the muscle to relax. This is how your muscles work most of the time in tetanus. Trepe means staircase effect and this is what warming up does for your muscles. We allow the muscles to contract, relax completely, and then we re-stimulate the muscle to contract again. When we do that, the second response is a little stronger than the first response. This is because we've built up some heat and that increases enzyme efficiency in the muscle. And also we haven't had a chance to pump all of the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we've got some calcium already out there and available for use. So trepe looks like this. We stimulate, we have a contraction, we let it relax completely, we stimulate, and we just keep doing that. Now there's a point at which you reach your maximum peak performance. And athletes have to know when this is. They want to warm up just enough that the next time they perform, they're at their peak performance. You'll see pitchers on the sidelines pitching, and they'll pitch kind of slow balls, but they will be using their muscles the same way they would if they're really pitching a nice fast ball. And once they get their muscles sort of warmed up, you'll see them put on a jacket because they want to keep the muscle warm. The other kind of graded response is the strength of the contraction. Multiple motor unit summation or recruitment is how this occurs. Increased voltage will stimulate more muscle fibers, more muscle cells will be engaged. Now there is a threshold stimulus. The first stimulus where we see a contraction is the threshold stimulus. And then we have a maximal stimulus. At this point, it's the maximum stimulus, the strongest stimulus that will produce contractile force. When we're at maximal stimulus, all of the units are recruited. All of the units are contracting. So if we look at this, here we have our threshold. Here we have our muscle, and you can see how many cells are involved based on each stimulus. So this first stimulus doesn't reach threshold. Nobody contracts. The second stimulus still doesn't reach threshold. Nobody contracts. But this one, we just reach threshold. So a couple of muscle cells in the muscle contract. And then we go a little above threshold and we recruit a few more cells. And as we continue to increase the voltage, we continue to recruit more and more cells. Once we reach that maximal stimulus, we've got everybody recruited. There's nobody else left to recruit. So even though we increase the strength of the stimulus, our muscle contraction is at its peak. The recruitment of cells is based on the size of the fiber. The motor units with the smallest muscle fibers are recruited first. They're the easiest to get to contract. Then motor units with larger fibers are recruited as stimulus intensity increases. And finally, the largest motor units are activated. These are used only for the most powerful contractions. So if we look at size, the small muscle fibers are recruited first. They're the first ones to contract. If the stimulus strength increases, the medium sized ones go. And if we get to maximum stimulus strength, all of the fibers, including these large ones, are recruited. Muscles will display something called muscle tone. This is a constant, slightly contracted state that all muscles are in. This is primarily due to spinal reflexes. Groups of motor units are alternately activated in response to input from various stretch receptors in the muscles. This keeps your muscles just slightly contracted. All of the motor units take turns so that no one fatigues. This helps keep muscles firm and healthy and also keeps you ready to respond. It also provides for joint stability and assists with posture. Contractions involve tension. Tension is simply the force exerted by a muscle. Load is the force exerted on a muscle by an object, some weight, something you're trying to move. We have two basic types of contractions. We have isotonic contractions and isometric contractions. In an isotonic contraction, the muscle will change length, but the tone will stay the same. The myofilaments will slide across each other. Now we have two kinds of contractions going on. We have concentric contractions. This is where the muscle shortens and does the work. Your biceps, for example, shortens if you pick up a book. But we also have eccentric contractions. Here the muscle contracts as it lengthens. This sounds a little strange, but this happens when you try to reverse the effect. You put the book down. 
This is important for coordination. If we didn't have this sort of muscle breaking going on, our actions might be too abrupt. So this allows for smoother movements. Isometric contractions are when tension builds in the muscle but nothing moves. The filaments do not slide over each other. Here the load is greater than the tension that we can produce in the muscle. This is very important in posture. It is a way people can exercise without using weights. Try to lift yourself while you're sitting in a chair. That would be an isometric type of contraction.